figure out the relationship between the horn and the body of the altar. And we think it's about a third. So that makes Dan one of the largest uh, altars that were discovered. As a matter of fact, everything that you discovered at Dan from the, in the sanctuary, in the high place, is the largest that was found in this country. And the kings uh, of Israel attached great importance, apparently, to the sanctuary uh, of Dan. That explains a very un, a difficult phrase in the prophet Amos. Amos complains to, and they tell to the people, stop uh, swearing by the God of Dan. The reason I think he picked up on Dan is because Dan was the central sanctuary of the northern kingdom. At the foot of the steps leading to the altar, an inscription in Greek and in Aramaic, which is a dedicated, it says in Greek, Teo, to the God who is in Dan. To the God who is in Dan, a man by the name of Zoilos made a vow. And Mr. Zoilos adds a line also in Aramaic, in the vernacular, which was used by the people, and says, in Dan, Zoilos made a vow to the God. So there's no doubt if we, anybody had any doubt about it, that we are in the sanctuary of Dan. One of the surprising discoveries were these five stones in the center of the room, uh, which we didn't realize at first what it could be until we found the iron shovels next to it. And then, from further excavation, we found a jar full of ashes. So there's no question in our mind that we have here an altar, uh, the like of which was used probably in the temple even of Jerusalem, and the sh iron shovels, you know, the Bible speaks of shovels constantly, but nobody has seen what an iron shovel looks like in the temple. Now, this is not from the temple in Jerusalem. This is from Tel Dan. But I have no d doubt in my mind that this is very much the same type of shovel. After the sacrifice was offered, the ashes were removed and put in a jar and next to it for safekeeping. During my 30 years of activity in archaeology, I think that this particular piece uh, got uh, more uh, publicity than any other finds that I discovered. This is a very special and important find because it is a statue, a bronze statue, quite heavy, I must say, uh, about uh, nine uh, inches long, uh, showing a young bull where it was found, uh, was examined by us. This particular place probably was a kind of a ritual place. Uh, the Bible calls such places a bama, that means a high place, on top of a hill, a high place, uh, surrounded by a stone. There was a stone that can be interpreted as a standing stone, you know, the biblical matzeba. Now, the bronze uh, bull is, of course, of great interest because we know that in the northern kingdom of Israel, the golden calf played a very important role in the temples of, Bet of Bethel and Dan. In none of these places, uh, the calves were uh, not found, of course, uh, but we have it Dan, we have the temple, the great shrine of Dan, where we assume that the golden calf was once standing. The fact that we find such a beautiful bull in a site which perhaps is related to ritual, to cult, to religious practice of Israelites in this early period is of great significance to the history of uh, this uh, religious symbol in Israel. The idolatry of such sites as Dan in the north spread to Jerusalem in the south. As a result, the fall of the Judean monarchy was assured. Archaeology has revealed the evidence of cultic practice during those days. Well, we are standing in the site of uh, the Israelite Tower, uncovered uh, in the early uh, 70s, about 15 meters below ground level. Probably this is the middle gate mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. It became the headquarters of the Babylonian army when they assaulted the city. They captured part of the city. They moved their headquarters to this point to the middle gate. And from here they finished the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in the year 586 BC. Here uh, on the floor, down below here, we uncovered the remains of the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, it seemed that the Babylonian army stood or uh, camped outside the city shoot arrows and uh, projectile and everything against the city and it's all fell down here just at the base of the wall on the floor we found here about 20 centimeters of ashes in the section layer and we were surprised to find here several arrowheads 
two of them I'm holding here in my hands, typical of those days. Well, here you can see in front of you a model of uh, a battering ram that uh, the same one depicted in the palace of uh, Sennacherib in uh, Nineveh that uh, show us the destruction of uh, the city of Lachish in the year 701 BC. The same battering ram were used by the Babylonian army here on the city of uh, the walls of Jerusalem. Here in the city of David, we find in the destruction layer from the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in 586, a burnt house and next to it a house of boule. A boule are small clay seal impressions that were used to secure papyrus documents that were given as letters of exchange. Hardened by the fire, these clay boule were stamped impressions revealing the names of individuals. Fifty-one were found in this room, and one of those had the name of Gemar Yahu, son of Shaphan, one of the scribes of King Jehoiakim, mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. Another bully bore the name of Baruch, the scribe of Jeremiah the prophet, who penned the biblical book. A close inspection of this bully brought a surprise when it was discovered to still bear the fingerprint of the ancient scribe. Archaeology can help us place Jesus and his disciples in their proper context. Here at the ancient site of Bethsaida, we come to a city that was very prominent in the whole story of Jesus. This was the city of Philip and Andrew and Peter, a fishing village. It was the place to which Jesus came and healed a blind man. It was the place where the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 took place. It was a place also from which the disciples set forth to meet Jesus as he was walking on the water. Here is a site that takes us then back to the actual context of the times of Jesus and helps us reconstruct the social environment, the city and the places which he knew. See, the uh, street of Bethsaida uh, that we have excavated is as far as we can say now, it's the only street that we have uh, encountered. And this is a very interesting and important uh, uh, discovery that we have made. And it is certainly a street where the apostles uh, uh, walked on and where Jesus was uh, and, and walked on. This is a uh, courtyard house that we have excavated, one of the uh, uh, courtyard houses in Bethsaida. The owners of this house, as well as the owners of the other buildings in, this, in Bethsaida, uh, were fishermen. They were doing a lot of fishing here. We discovered a lot of fishing implements here. And even in this house, we have discovered uh, fishing implements, including uh, anchors. <coughs> here is one. An unexpected glimpse of the lifestyle of Jesus and his disciples appeared in the late 1980s when the Sea of Galilee receded during a dry season. In the muddy bottom was revealed the outline of a first century fishing boat, which had to be carefully removed due to its extremely fragile condition. After being transported to a special preparation area, it spent 10 years in a chemical bath, recently emerging for exhibition as the Jesus boat. Further evidence of the life of Jesus was unearthed in the excavations at Capernaum. Here, black basalt remains of the synagogue in which Jesus preached appear as the foundations of a later Byzantine one. In this synagogue, the Gospels record many of Jesus' sermons. Next door, many houses were discovered, including one believed to be that of Simon Peter, apparently preserved by a third century Byzantine church. Excavations at Masada were first begun by Yigel Yadin. In later times, Professor Ehud Netzer has renewed excavations and found in them some amazing confirmation of a New Testament figure. Uh, this is a, one of a series of uh, amphora, uh, uh, jars, special jars to, import, to bring wine from f long distance with the boats, and it came from Italy. Uh, and uh, was shipped uh, especially for Herod. And in the last uh, sentence we have King, Herod, and beginning of Judea, apparently. King, uh, Herod King of, of Judea. In Herodium, in any event, it was not just a palace, but it was a memorial for himself. It's the only site named after King Herod and where he planned to be buried.